Thank you. Well, very loud. How's everyone doing? Yesterday, I think it was a bit louder when it was about winning a phone. So uh, let, let's pretend you're going to win something. Can you see it? It's a little Android loudspeaker. So, so who's interested in that? Oh, now I see a bit more excitement. Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll get started. And um, I'm going to try it. This. Okay, that works. Um, who's been to a DroidCon before? Hey, we have a few fans here. <laughs> Yesterday doesn't count, by the way. <laughs> Who's been to a DroidCon before? Hey, we have three, four? Okay, so um, in general, I just go around the room and say, who's been to two DroidCons, three DroidCons, etc. But I think as this is brand new here, I'll, I'll stop with one. Um, I've probably been to about six or seven by now, so uh, I kind of been there from the start, if you want, and just wanted to give you an impression of how it all started. It all started in Berlin in 2009 or so, um, when a bunch of guys started getting together and said, hey, we have no Android developer event in Europe. Um, there's loads of stuff going on in the US, but we'd like to get the Android community together in Europe on a regular basis. Google were not really helping in those days, and say, hey, let, let's get it going. And this is where the first event started, 250 people. It was quite big, and so big that us in London, I'm, I'm, I'm based in London, decided to, to start creating one. We didn't manage to, to, uh, to beat the Germans uh, this time, um, but um, that just, I love political jokes, so uh, please excuse me for any political joke I'm gonna make. Um, and they did a second event just six months later and um, got about 500 people there. And then suddenly everyone started thinking, hey, Android is big, this is the way to go. Um, we did another one in London, quite big as well. Um, and actually, last time I, uh, I really spoke in front of a big audience was, uh, no, actually, not uh, at Droidcom. My first presentation was in Berlin that year before. 550 people. I bring my computer, a bit like today, plug it onto the, uh, onto the system, crashes my presentation, deletes it, nothing. 15 minutes presenting from an Excel spreadsheet. <laughs> I was extremely popular at the end. People were like, what the fuck is this guy doing? I just don't understand. He's talking about figures we can barely see. So uh, things have improved since. It took a while to put everything in place. But this time, they didn't delete my presentation. So I can stay longer, lucky me. Um, last event we had in Berlin was about 650 people. That was really good. And for the first time then, we really started having a lot of people interested abroad uh, to organize more droid cons. Uh, we had one in Bucharest a few weeks back, a few months back. Um, that was pretty fun. I wanted to actually show a little droid con with um, vampire uh, things in Bucharest just to, to just showcase the, the uh, but uh, I didn't have time to do it. I was trying to do that in a taxi yesterday and imagine doing like aligning all these little droids in a taxi. Sorry, but the roads are a bit like. Uh, so I'm really lucky that they managed to be all lined up. Uh, then we had our event in London uh, months back or so with Kieran being there and, uh, and that was a really fun event. But I have to say, we only reached 650. And here, like for the first event, whoa, let's go back. <laughs> for the first event, we managed to have 550 people, and that really kicked out. <laughs> so, all to you guys. Really great job. So, I hope you enjoy the, the process. But the, um, the first DroidCon I've been to, and ever since it's been like this, um, we asked everyone on the first day to step up and introduce themselves on the mic. 550 people. If I do that, my whole presentation is not going to happen. Uh, but what, we, what I'm going to do is ask you all to stand up. Come on. Look around you. Find someone you don't know. Chat with them. There must be someone you don't know around you. Go further up. If you can't find anyone next to you, just go further up.
I see a few people who are not talking to anyone. Like you too. Come on, go around, chat with someone. Go back. It's not acceptable not to talk to anyone. You, the whole row there. I'm gonna go through the whole through the road and get everyone chatting if need be. is not talking. I see you there. Just like, go around, go at the back, go chat with people. No one's going to steal your, your seat. Super interesting. All of us. I'd like to have all hands up. Come on. <laughs> now, now you know this is what Droidcom is all about. It's about meeting people. It's about finding what other people are doing and just exchanging ideas, exchanging cards, coming back later, doing things together, creating new open source projects, so on and so forth. So um, keep the spirit going, and, and I'm sure that. Throughout the day today, you'll keep it going in the future as well. And um, what I'm going to try to talk about, if my remote control works, <coughs> finally works, is um, about how in this world, the world of application and the world of mobility, there's loads of teaching, loads of people talking about things and really half knowing what they're talking about. And I'm just going to bust a couple of cliches here today. Um, it's going to be fairly simple, you'll see. Nothing particularly bad. I think this remote control won't work, so I use the foot control. <laughs> foot control doesn't work either. That's annoying. Uh, what is this? So roti, yeah, it's pretty good. Uh, yesterday, I was told that um, you guys are fan of roti. Uh, where I come from, we, we, we also love roti, but it's a very different thing. It's a roast. It's, it's beef, very often, actually. I'm sorry to say that. It's very politically incorrect. Um, it's also the name we give to the bricks. Uh, and this is about, all because we believe they really can't cook. <laughs> Uh, so especially when there's like a rugby game, we call the bricks the roast beef, and, uh, and which is my language, the roti. Uh, so there you go. This is a bit of a... So you can see, there's one thing we have in common. We love food, and we're not too keen on the bricks. <laughs> Sorry, there's a couple of bricks in the room right now. <laughs> but as I say, let's not be politically correct. Um, all this to say that I'm French. Uh, and you know, I mean, one thing we know about the French is that they don't know anything about technology. So I'm really sorry you're going to hear about technology from a French person where the only thing the French have done for technology is this thing. Has anyone heard about this? Hands up. 
Who's heard about that? One hand. So for, for those of you who haven't heard about it, this is the Minitel. In the 1990s, the French government decided that they would do this kind of closed internet that would be accessed via this kind of remote terminal that they would give away to everyone in the country. Uh, with about 14K bandwidth, uh, you would imagine the kind of screens that we had. It was really entertaining. Um, so, so that's my youth. I uh, started going online with this kind of stuff, and, uh, and that's where you get in the end. Um, so don't be, like, you can't really trust me for technology. Um, but I'm very opinionated. Can, you, can anyone like, pick the quote here? Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs, exactly. And what I hate about the way technology has evolved lately, especially in mobile, is it's all black and white. It's all Star Wars. It's all like good versus evil. Or in that case, the not so good uh, and the not evil uh, sometimes. Um, but frankly, do we really want a black and white story? So, I mean, I'm going to just give you the black and white story the way it's been told in the last two years. 19, no, 2004, 2005. Who was doing mobile application development in 2004, 2005? This is where I'm showing my age. I have a couple of hands up. Well, do you remember those days? It was awful. It was dark. Like, fragmentation was there. It was just impossible to sell an app because you had to go through OEM or for operators. This, that, there was no fun in this world. And then Steve Jobs came. The light. He saved us all. He brought us the iPhone. Yeah? Every, and like suddenly everyone could just become rich by doing the mobile phone application. And it was absolutely fantastic. I got a really sorry, but then the story goes on that Android arrived. I fucked up everything. <laughs> it, like fragmentation started to come again. Like there was all these devices all over the place, not just one. Um, a lot of people would say they were ugly, uh, the user interface was just completely random and so on and so forth, and, and just fucked up everything really. And then, if you believe the world now, it's all HTML5, HTML5 is going to be the new right. No more fragmentation, simple to develop for. You're going to be able to, kind of, no more app stores, like you're going to be able to kind of um, deploy your applications everywhere. But there's a black element coming next that you can see coming. I don't know if any one of you um, has tried, I mean, in the UK, I've had with Vodafone. And recently, I sent one of my friends a WhatsApp invite. And they go on the phone, and they go on the WhatsApp WhatsApp website from their phone. It's blocked. So no way to access WhatsApp from Vodafone, because obviously they know that they're going to cut on their revenues. So what's going to happen with HTML5? Does that mean that operators are going to suddenly decide well, you can get that and then you can't get and so on and so forth? So no more ad stores, but we're back into the operator problem. What do you think about these black and white stories? Like the white, the iPhone, the black, the Android, or I should say white and green, maybe. And recently, I don't know if you follow the news a bit, but um, Stephen Elop said, oh, there's a third ecosystem coming in. And the blue up here is in the middle, and it's not going to be black and white or black, white and green, but there's going to be like three colors. There's a big problem. Like when I hear those three colors, <laughs> it's And that was an interesting video. That was an interesting. So black and white is dead. It's all about gray. And actually, you see those guys. Like, do you remember this guy when he had like black hair? He's not gray hair. Uh, why is he grey hair? He suddenly buys patents. Google and patents in the past used to be like, no, 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 patents are for people who are losers, people who just can't innovate all the time. Well, let's buy Motorola, just in case. <laughs> Look at the guy on the right. I mean, he, he did loads of cool stuff, but one thing he did as well is like, you know, buddy up with Microsoft to buy patents as well. It's like Apple, Microsoft in the same camp? It's like, huh. Um, so yeah, you can't be black and white anymore. You have to think grey. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to think old, um, just think in the middle, try to find your way in. So what I'm going to talk about in our presentation is therefore a few cliches where people will try to make you think black and white and then where you will have to think the grey and try to kind of highlight what this grey is all about. So the first thing is you, the app developer. 
For a long time, people have led us to think that the app developer was the guy who was coding on his own and doing his application and becoming rich and so on and so forth. But it doesn't work like this because the app developer is might be just like hiding away and just wanting silence in order to code and so on and so forth. But people were always comparing him with the design guy, the UI, the front-end guy, always beautiful, always doing this nice stuff around, uh, who was always uh, getting all the attention. But the reality is, nowadays, they have to do a couple. You have to have a designer on one side, you have to have a developer on the other. But I'm French. <laughs> Couples do not exist. Have you heard of Ménage à Trois? So you have to have a menage à trois. And in order to have a menage à trois, I'm afraid this is a very like, masculine environment. You need a backhand person. You need the guy to do the script. You need to have the guy who does uh, take care of the server and so on and so forth. So that is the, the new menage à trois of software development, of application development, the designer, the, the developer who does the native stuff, and the backhand guy. And at the same time, we all know a team doesn't need to be all together at the same time. A team can be virtual, it can be anywhere. And um, maybe money from being in the team doesn't mean having them around you. You can just work with different people around the world. So that's where ODES comes in. So that's the first thing. Teams are changing. Application development, the face of application development is changing. I kind of hinted on that and HTML5 and, and what I think about it. Um, it's beautiful. It, it, frankly, it has that great stuff about HTML5, but then don't believe it. Don't believe it in this kind of like unity. Because if you start looking into HTML5, you realize that there's about a zillion different approaches to HTML5, uh, different frameworks that are available. Uh, I'm just leaving a few here. And anyone here could just like grab some uh, web kit and create their own framework. I know a lot of people who are writing their own HTML5 frameworks for different stuff. So it's not as simple as it sounds like, it's not as unified uh, as it sounds like. As a matter of fact, I don't know if anyone of you has been looking at um, different handsets and what they support. I know it's like barely seeable, it's a website, it's just like, like Google Maps. These are the various HTML5 attributes that are supported by various websites, by various phones. And you have a lot of orange, a lot of red, and very little green, frankly. So HTML5 is not going to save everything. At the same time, whenever I go to, uh, who here has been on a web versus app um, panel, or discussion, or attending something of, of this nature? What was your feeling? Like, black and white, eh? Like, some guys on the other will say one thing, guys on the other will just say yeah, something else, and they don't really listen to one another, and at the end you feel like, what have I learned? It's like, I've heard people preaching on both sides. That's exactly my feeling. And whenever I've been on these things, I feel that the application developer guy is, is really the native guy, is like the tooth cooler, the dentist of the old days. It's like, you know what? I'm, I'm not a doctor, but I can tell you that if your tooth hurts and if I remove it, it will not hurt anymore. It's kind of normal, it's, it sounds kind of cool. Uh, so that was the only option. In order to do a certain number of things, like UX and, and have like responsive uh, interface and so on and so forth, you need to go native. And you can't really explain why it works, but it does. And as a matter of fact, if you take a look at um, what people spend their time on, on Android and especially, they spend most of the time on apps. However, the bad news is, so therefore, doing apps is cool, that this, you know, you will have time from people. However, if you take a look at the famous long tail. The long tail in mobile is not as thick as it is in the web right now. So you take a look at the 10 top applications, they take about 40% of the time of people. When on the web, you take the top 10 websites and they take about only 20% of the clicks. So the tail is a bit thinner, um, but there's good things coming. Um, and I can talk about it a bit later. The fact is that apps, a lot of people hate apps because fragmentation. Uh, you, know, you start on one platform, then you need to do it on the other, and then the platform is just super fragmented, and then you take forever and it costs you money and so on and so forth. The fact is, and that's what I tell to anyone who bitches about fragmentation, 
people who manage to deal with fragmentation are rich. Now you take a look at Java and e Blackberry. Who does Java and e or Blackberry here? A couple of hands. Super fragmented. I mean, Blackberry is a pain. Let's face it. Um, but people who made Blackberry apps and J2E apps are happy because they managed, like, everyone else walked off because they thought it was just too difficult and too fragmented. And those guys managed to make a lot more money than a lot of the Android developers and Symbian developers and so forth. So there's a reward to, to managing difficulty. That's the first thing. Um, however, you have to give it to Android. Like today, this is the innovation platform. Like wh wherever I go to a hackathon or whenever I go to an event that kind of displays the best, most promising apps of the moment, Android is always there, always first. So Big here is the right place if you want to be innovators. That's, that's the good news. One other thing, though, is, as I said, I'm not a black or white person. I'm going to give you the gray. All these apps here are what I call gray apps. Have you heard of, of any of those? Financial Time, Facebook. Um, so I could go and explain some of them. But I was lucky enough on Tuesday to organize uh, a great event with a guy from Facebook who actually explained to us how they managed to do their platform. So I thought, as a lot of you are pretty technical here, I'm going to show you these slides. I'm going to see still these slides. Um, so this is how they, they started off doing the, uh, the Facebook apps. They used to have like poor br bad browser, good browser, Facebook for iPhone, Facebook for Android, and, and, um, and over time they, they managed to kind of get to that stage where they had a single platform that was managing all the various websites and then the iPhone app and the Android app. This is what they're doing now. They have this thing called FaceWeb that allows you them to basically take all the web content into an native app. And that's what it looks like. The, the, the container is native, but all the content inside is, is all web. And it all taken from the uh, n.facebook.com. Uh, so great works. Gray makes things simple, gray makes things, because if you look at, at this side, obviously, it's, this is much simpler um, to manage than the one before. So things can be simple and so on and so forth. And the other thing that a lot of people think about apps is you make money by selling them. I'm sorry that, I mean, I guess most of you in the room know that on Android, if you try to make money by selling an app, this is probably not the way to go. Um, and the fact is that even people who sell their apps nowadays only sell them because they want to make money from services. I know a lot of public companies who actually make much more money by the service they offer after an app has been successful than they make from just selling the app itself. Um, because an app nowadays can be many things. Um, there's the CD app. Right? That's basically, I don't know if, how it works here, but in, in, well, in Europe, if you want to get a job as a software developer and you haven't got an app on Android Market, like, you're not going to be hired. Like, you can just pretend that you can do app or you can just show it to me. And uh, you can just put on your CV on a perfect Android developer. If you don't have an app somewhere that proves it, then you're nothing to me. Um, and that's becoming true for individual, but that's also true for companies. Um, a few other, I mean, there's loads of different business models here that you can see for people who write apps. Um, but the ones I quite like is um, Swifty. Who, know, who uses Swifty here? No one uses Swifty keyboard? Oh, quite a few hands. If you, so for those who don't use Swifty keyboard, go download it, it's free, it's fun. It, you type much faster after this, it's pretty new. good. But the company was a company, that, what they do is they do AI, um, and they do natural language processing, and they wanted to apply that technology to something and they had no idea what, and then they thought, hey, maybe we could do interesting keyboards that actually help you type because they understand what you're talking about. Um, and they, they did that beautiful keyboard, they knocked at the doors of a couple of OEMs, and phone manufacturers told them, hey, there's about 10 other people that do keyboards out there, why would I buy yours? Why would I give you money for that? They got to scratch their head, it's like, yeah, okay, this sounds like a difficult one. So they did an app. Put it onto Android Market, and in no time they were one of the top paying downloads. And they suddenly started seeing a lot of people coming to them and say, 
Why? You're very successful. It looks like what you're doing works. Can I actually buy it to put on the two every single phone I'm going to ship from now on? So what you can see is a company who is a technology company who does an app to get recognition to really, in the long term, become the real technology company they want to be. So you have to think differently about apps. Um, and, and this is just a few examples. But it's a busy playing field. A lot of people look at the world of apps and say, oh, there's too many apps. How am I going to differentiate? Well, have you ever like, asked anyone, what is too many? Too many compared to what? I mean, we're all the engineers here, uh, or probably the majority of us. And like, when someone tells me there's too many, I say, too many compared to what? Um, so I've been asking myself the question, and I started doing the math. Too many apps, what does that mean? So I compared like, different platforms, took the number of apps there were, compared to the number of downloads of apps there were, and you do the division. Quite simple. It's like average number of app downloads per month per app. And suddenly you have very interesting, interesting facts. You have the fact that Nokia is probably the best platform to put your apps in than Android, and that Windows Phone 7, despite the fact that it doesn't sell anything, is already over to like really crowded compared to other platforms because it doesn't sell anything, there's no download, therefore, and, but still 35,000 apps because they kind of pay people to do those apps. So what I read that, I say, okay, yeah, it is a bit crowded, but at the same time, I have a feeling of some places that are crowded than others. But the real place that I want to, to measure against is the web. Are apps crowded than the web? Most of the startups I know nowadays launch apps rather than a website or really concentrate on the app element, are they right or wrong? So who believes they're right? Who would start their startup launching an app? Who would launch their startup launch with a website? So, the website wins. How many websites are launched every year? 21 million. Did you see 21 million apps there? No, 21 million websites. So you say, okay, there's a lot more traffic on the web. Well, let's do the math. Uh, here are the figures. So you can do the math in your head. 255 million websites out there today. 21 million every year. And then you, you do the division. And uh, number of downloads or page views per month is 2.6 billion, or, or 2,600 billion which is 11,000 page views on average per website. Who does a bit of SEO, who does a, who does a bit of website stuff here? How does it feel? 11,000 page views a month. Not very really good, does it? Then you start dividing that by, let's say, imagine half of your users are new users and half of them are repeated users. It's that, you mean that you only have 5,500 um, new, new page views a month from new users. And then you imagine that every new user actually sees three pages on your website. Well, let's use five because it makes the math much easier. Um, because I'm just doing it right now. So, five page views per month per, per user on average, three, and 5,500 new users. That means that um, for new page views per new, by new users, that means that there's only 1,100 new users per website per month, compared to 3,300 new downloads of your app every month. What does it tell you? You might as well launch an app rather than a website. But those who wanted to launch an app were right. Okay, it's it's all kind of like. Nothing scientific here. But as I say, what I'd like to do is bring the gray perspective and discuss it, rather than just hide these figures. No one shows these kind of figures out there. Um, and by the way, people tell me, hey, you never put any um, of the sources onto your slides. I don't make up these figures. So if, you, if you want to find out where they come from, just ask me. In general, I try to put it down at the bottom. Uh, if it's not there, it means that it comes from different sources and then the page would be actually like a sources uh, slide. So, but the, it's, it's actual proper data. Um, 
So we just proved that doing apps versus websites was actually not that crowded. The other thing that people tell you is, hey, the problem with the web with um, apps is there's only one app store. I've been to events, like I told you I'm French. I did one event in France in my life, and I talked once in my life only at a French event. And French is quite weird because app stores, plural, sounds the same as app store singular. What that meant is for about 35 minutes, I talked about app stores plural. And then I walked out of my presentation and people looked at me, why did you only talk about one app store? <laughs> I wasted 35 minutes of my life. I decided not to speak in France anymore. That was the end of it. Um, but there are, how many app stores are there? Wild, wild figures. Okay, I'm going to give away like a lot of stickers to people who give me figures. They are smart developer figures. If you want to be a smart developer. Okay. 10? 100. 10? 100. Equal to the number of telcos. Each telco has an app store. Okay. So, I'm, I'm going to give you a figure, which is we run a website. That he tries to list all the app stores on the planet. We reached about 140 now. I was chatting with a guy from China the other day who was telling me that he believed in China was 6,000. <laughs> I, like, I don't need Chinese. I, I don't think I want to list all the Chinese app stores out there. Because more or less everyone in China just like gives away different uh, apps, cracked ones, non cracked ones on, on, on their websites, or, and so on and so forth. But the reality is there's quite a lot of them. And more and more people concentrate on app store to distribute their apps. But what you have to think about is do not concentrate on one app store. Play them one against the other. I mean, Amazon is very famous for distributing apps for free. Um, but when you do that, you actually get very interesting results where if you have free app in Amazon for one day, your downloads in Android market are going up. I always had, I also had people telling me that by doing this on Amazon, they had the iPhone apps downloads going up. Like, unbelievable. People talk. And when they talk with their friends, they actually talk with their friends across platform. That, that's quite a scary thing. Um, but you have to think about playing them against the other. Um, but also, like, there's always someone willing to feature your app. And if you're featured in a small app store that's only for, let's say, Germany, you will see your downloads go up in the Android market as well. Um, so this, like, you have to be clever about these things. And one thing that you know, people will take a look at me and say, hey, why are you always pitching about app stores? Why are you just talking about kicking their butt? The reason I do that is because I believe the app store belongs to the developers. I do, like people would tell me, oh, the app stores are controlled by Apple and so on and so forth. No, they're not. A bit, but not entirely. And the reason I say that is because we are paying for the marketing of the app store. They look, people give me like, when was the last time I paid for it? Like, so is it to get from, from taxes or anything? No, here's where it comes from. 250,000 new apps every year. Writing an app depends on where you are. $5,000 probably the cheapest in country, is probably okay, some others uh, depend on the quality of the app and so on and so forth. But I reckon that 20% of that money is then spent on marketing. So a lot of people just stare at me at this point, too. what do you mean? Like, I don't spend any money marketing my app. So, who came here thinking of talking about their apps to other people, to a news journalist, to an OEM, something like this. Three? More than that. I know I've had a lot of people telling me about their apps. You're here because you want to learn, but you're also here because you want to tell the people that you did this cool app, and you'd like them to kind of have a look at it, download it, and so on and so forth. You go to events, you spend your time on these things, you write on your website, hey, I'm available on Android Market, you spend time trying to get people to your website to send them on Android Market. Basically, you spend an entire like, budget, whether it's real money or whether it's time and so on so forth, marketing uh, all these app stores out there. And 20% is actually extremely low in my view. 
multiply those 250,000 US by, a, by this figure, $1,000, you get this huge budget here, which is our marketing budget. This is what we spend marketing, Android markets, app stores, and so on and so forth. How does this compare? Once again, like it's, it looks like a huge figure, but what does it compare to? Well, here are two figures. So 55 million compares to the 400 million budget of Windows Phone 7. So one eighth of Windows Phone 7 launch budget. Hey, not bad, given that none of us here are such rich as Steve Jobs. Or if someone else, someone is, just let me know and you can buy me a drink later. Um, I mean, we can choose a nice place as well. Go on, go out to see John. Um, and then you compare that with the Apple advertising budget in 2008. So you about a tenth of that. That's not that, frankly. I mean, none of us are that rich. So what I, wanted to, what I tried to do here is try to take a couple of things. Like whenever I tell you, what is an app? What is the app economy? They always tell you apps is what developers do. Apps is just technology. There's like an Android app, there's an iPhone app, there's this app. Apps are business model. You take your app, you put it in the app store, you get money back. And there's just one thing, there's just the app store. What I'll tell you is not the case. And what you're here for, and what you're going to have to do in order to be successful in this space, is to challenge the statements. Put the no there and decide for yourself and find out for yourself what this gray world in the middle is. If you like this presentation, you can scream now. <laughs> if you want more information, you can ask questions now. You can also contact me on all these kind of communication methods there. Uh, but a couple of questions would be fun. Oh, and I give things away for... Actually, uh, there's always very few presents only for women at these conferences. So I bought a women t-shirt for DroidCon London. But I thought I would reward all the women in the audience. It's a small size. So who wants it? Who is small size women here? You're going to have to fight. You're going to have to ask a question. Side. No, you know, I, I, I didn't see one. Oh. <laughs> Questions, anyone? There's a t-shirt associated with it. Now the pressure is intense. Okay, okay we have a question. Otherwise, I was going to give it to someone's girlfriend or wife. So. Can you pronounce your name? <laughs> Thibaut. There you go. It's uh, French names are awful. It's just way too many. Whoa, I did press the wrong button. Uh, way too many letters. It's simple as Thibaut. Any other questions? Okay, I'm going to bribe the questions. We have a fantastic singing Android look. <laughs> now we have loads of questions. <laughs> it's amazing how bribery works. <laughs> and then people want to touch corruption. <laughs> as long as human beings, you would like to reply to, to, to. What's the question? My last name is Rufino, so... You saw this black and white, uh, you explained about the black and white stuff, that is, uh, Apple saying uh, Android has copied, or... Uh, we, we have a lot of such things happening. So what happens to innovation in this case? In this scenario, what happens to inno innovation? What's your perspective? Uh, which means, uh, for example, if I'm a developer, today I start uh, development with Android, and tomorrow, uh, there may be some other uh, OS, or there may be something else that comes up, and I start developing for it. And is it just about this, or is there innovation? Or is it competition itself that's driving innovation? What's your perspective? It's a vast question. 
Yeah, I'm going to try to kind of risk it a bit, uh, and then if I don't answer your question, you think just come back to me later. But um, there's different things to this. Uh, first of all, I believe that innovation and greatness is absolutely crucial because a lot of people try to just you know stay in one silo. And you, you can do like good innovation on Android, you, you can try to push the boundary of the platform and so on and so forth. What you're going to be able to do if you do that is really cool apps for Android. You're going to have a market for this. Um, as I mentioned, we, I mentioned SwiftKey, um, I mentioned um, the, the guy from Iris. I think that is absolutely cool. I love AI, that's what I used to do when I was a developer. So I did it. So I believe it's like cool thing that are very niche, very integrated uh, into the platform. There's going to be innovation there. However, I believe innovation and greatness has got the biggest rewards because it's going to be portable. It's going to be able to go across. Some of the guys I mentioned there in my great slide, there's a company called Game Alive. They have like a fantastic gaming framework, all HTML5 based, that allows you to port games like all the Pongs and stuff like this onto HTML5 and play Pong with two people on two phones, even though they could be on two sides of the planet. All HTML5 base, that kicks ass. And, and I believe this is people who say, look, I'm going to build like a native framework, but I'm going to put an HTML5 thing on top that makes it very easy for people to do stuff. And, and so short answer, I think there's really two directions. And, um, and it's really down to you and what, you, what you'd like to do. And, and what you think you do that. Kind of an answer. So you win. The first question wins. I'll give you the If there's bits and bobs missing, just let me know. I just bought it in Hong Kong, so there might be a bits falling and stuff. But... <laughs> I have no more things. But you can still ask a question. That's cool. Uh, where do you see patent wars in this black or white or gray? Where do you see patent wars? Open source patent wars? I, I think open source and patent wars are two different things. Um, you can actually, I used to, right now, just in case you throw me something, I used to work for Sydney. <laughs> And um, I used to, I moved Sydney from Sydney to Sydney Foundation because I've been working with Eclipse Foundation for a long time. So I think these are two, open source and patent are uh, two different things. You can create patent pool, and patent pools are actually extremely powerful stuff. And I believe in patent pools. I think this is great. Patent pools are great. They're, they're the, the kind of thing that basically means you bring the, all the people who have patents order together, you force them in some ways to kind of give it away to the community with some kind of rules and restrictions. Um, but if you don't, if you don't do that, um, you end up in the kind of pattern war that we're having now. And, um, and I believe the guys at IBM and what they do, the patents pool system that they have in Active Foundation are the way to go. There was a question here. If you scream out loud, I'll repeat the question. Now, I have, to, I have to think hard about like a company I know so that really effectively only lives on apps and apps money. Uh, because most of the companies I know say they do live on apps, but really they live on services on the back of it or technology. I, I, I really struggle to find a company that, apart from games, so games is different. Like, if you do games, like you live in a separate world. Like, if you do games, some of the stuff that I talked about barely or like barely apply. I mean, you live in a great world because you use like a gaming development framework and you can sell your app and, and that's one stream. Um, but the rest of us, I think they, there's, there's no other ways. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So um, does anyone here knows a game called Pop? It's a voice activated game. Simple is very simple. You have a spaceship and you shoot at little UFOs that are attacking you. So you are, uh, and your the, the space goes up and down, and you do pop, and it shoots. And you can download it, it's a lot of fun. And you can play, we, we actually could do a, a joint session where everyone screams at their phone later on. <laughs> um, so you're gonna have a lot of fun. Um, they made about $50,000 of downloads, uh, of, of sales. They made about 10 times that amount in services. How? Simple. A brand sees that and say, wow, absolutely fantastic. The attachment between the user and the application is great. I want to do similar voice activated thing. I want to do like something that interacts with my brand in a similar way and so on and so forth. So they bring that principle, they put it into loads of other markets and they sell services. Yeah? Good example? Uh, so. I think it's almost time to go past the What? Oh, I was enjoying myself. <laughs> Were you enjoying this? I'm here on Brian Boy, but it's still an hour time. So. Okay, cool. Well, thanks a lot. You can find me, I think, so uh, easy to spot. Thanks a lot. <laughs>